look at the reality and experiential context of how the pandemic has played out and how the narratives have changed and emerged over the time in the first wave it was about older people with comorbidities in the second wave young people some vaccinated without comorbidities are being lost which means there are children whose parents are being affected children who have lost their parents children who have lost both parents and so and and now there is talk of the of the third wave and everyone is speaking about the fourth wave entirely in the context of mental health and mental you know well being because we don't know what the impact of the pandemic is going to be David would you when the pandemic was beginning in Turkey and lockdowns were underway and people were very concerned about what this would mean for for children uh, and children's lives and education and similarly in Australia and elsewhere there were many many um ideas that were given about what parents should be doing uh, across the world you know, the different ways of doing formal education anyway all sorts of ideas but it seemed very few people had actually consulted children about this so a colleague in turkey um and his child actually put out the invitation to well why don't we ask children about what uh, parents and caregivers can be doing um during these covid times together what can households be doing together and obviously that's different in the first wave is different in the second wave i'm not trying to make light of the hardships in any ways but actually here in children's perspectives um has made a big difference to those who've been involved in the project they've been you just couldn't imagine the sorts of things that children were going to suggest that that um uh, uh could be done and couldn't be done and um then this meant that a, a guide book was created a guide book for adults created by children and uh this could then be shared and exchanged and parents could share this with their kids and then consult their kids to add to it so this becomes a living document children in gaza um some years ago um not the most recent uh bombardment of gaza but quite some years previously um a narrative practitioner Sue Mitchell was was there and obviously profound despair profound suffering uh and profound concern about what this is meaning for not only um parents and um whole communities but also for children's lives but there was a chance to consult with children about their knowledge about what they were doing either during military attacks or after military attacks and uh quite extraordinary documents were generated um that could then also be shared and so they're the sorts of um things i think of when you mentioned paulo freire trying to seek um answers in the right places in times of despair who's suffering who therefore has the knowledge about this suffering and what contribution might they make to others what efforts are they making that we can witness children and young people are done talking about mental health problems and mental health struggles they want to do something they want to make a difference they want to contribute and i'm hearing this with children and young people i don't know if shaker if you seeing that they want to make a difference like this 17 year old i'm talking about that the teachers i'm talking about uh, we say aao soche saath hum let's think together uh so this is something that we are hearing and we are hoping is going to be one big thing as we move forward consulting children consulting young people and inviting them as uh you know agents of social change so um uh, shekhar if i can come to you with this you know um uh mental health professionals and uh, you know in our indian context across the world have a tendency to stay within the hospitals within within our therapy rooms right and it's and i can i totally get that you know because as a therapist i know i love staying in my therapy room and working with those families and children and it's it's a comfort comfort zone for us but we need to come out of these 
spaces we need to and i know you do a lot of work with your with the community with um, the work you do with samvad uh, how can we come out and how can we work in the community to privilege diverse local practices and knowledges that we are not privileging right now look at the reality and experiential context of how the pandemic has played out and how the narratives have changed and emerged over the time in the first wave it was about older people with comorbidities in the second wave young people some vaccinated without comorbidities are being lost which means there are children whose parents are being affected children who have lost their parents children who have lost both parents and so and and now there is talk of the of the third wave and everyone is speaking about the fourth wave entirely in the context of mental health and mental you know well being because we don't know what the impact of the pandemic is going to be let's also look at those four five six year olds in the context of the lockdown and what it is going to do to a generation of childhood children who are one month old six months old are in any case sometimes confined to the house adolescents have their own frustrations but for four five and six year olds who need social spaces and peer interactions and the start of school what is pandemic going to do in an entire generation of children and it's time that mental health and psychology thought about that coming to the specificity of the issue that you have raised and and i take child mental health because that's my domain the practice of child mental health cannot be restricted to consultation chambers it has to extend to all those spaces that children occupy and inhabit homes and the families and schools whenever they open and child care institutions because children occupy so many spaces that and the mental health fraternity in terms of numbers simply does not have the bandwidth to deal with the huge numbers that we are t- you know talking about uh, in and not just in terms of morbidity but but in terms of wellness what i'm very curious to know like i think what you know what you said just now that we are looking at all stakeholders right and you know one of the stakeholders the children and the youth right the children and the youth how do they how how can we involve them in this partly D- david had already referred to this when he spoke about how do you incorporate and give valence to the voice of children in anything that you design in terms of intervention particularly from a public health uh, perspective that and unfortunately uh, the people who are least heard are children uh, you know you, you're intending to serve them but you don't listen to what their stories and their voices are that and a, what a lot of people are doing now uh, in the pandemic many agencies are actually inviting and and recording children's experiences the subjectivity of their realities uh, their aspirations uh, the frustrations of, of their aspirations uh, what they have seen as their companions and peers uh, experiencing a predicament that may not be theirs personally but someone known to them is facing so one part of it is actually to to invite uh, to record to acknowledge um, and to in in some ways memorialize these narratives of children Yeah. The se- the second is really to look at how adolescents as as peer educators as as peer helpers and as peer carers that you build a force a network of of people uh, of young people who know when to respond how to respond how to look at serious issues so that they know at which stage something is beyond their capacity to deal with but like i said not all issues are necessarily severe in terms yeah. of a of a medical or a clinical nature i'm very curious we're talking about social action we're talking about social cohesion we're talking about social movement we're talking about looking for hope in 
the right places right and i'm wondering what role does art music particularly songs of sustenance play in the social movement david if i can start with you and then come to shaker so certainly well um I just want to say the one thing I also want to just mention is about memorialization and I think song plays a huge part in that too and I just know there's been so much loss in India and I began by mentioning about how in Rwanda they've had to create 100 days of memory um I don't know what's going to be created in India out of this collective loss but my guess is that children and young people will also be able to be involved in that and to think about in Rwanda they had to think not only about the loss but what are the legacies that people want to carry on from those people who have passed on well i can just imagine so many songs um that could be crafted when asking children or young people what do you remember about that person who's passed on what was particularly special about them to you what do you want to carry on into this life or let people in the future know about this person um and those could uh be put in many forms it's a beautiful paper by Maya Sen um who's written about the alternative rituals that are having to be created to um uh, assist in memorialization uh, now but songs could be a cr- crucial part of that and Sheldra I know you wrote that beautiful piece recently love means never having to say goodbye and I just think songs of memory songs of legacy um including songs from young people and children about what they want the world to know and always remember about those people who passed on could be uh, extraordinarily sustaining not only for the kids but uh, for the older people in families crystal gaze into the near future with our series be inspired that takes you into the world of ai medicine space good governance economy and so much more subscribe to our channel now